my son who hasn't had an adolescence, remember your adolescence. Yeah, yeah. Anyone here <coughs> ever go to a blue light police disco? Yes, a few of you. Well, you'll recognise that uh, in, yeah, there's a little part of my story about that. So, when I was a teenager, I had uh, a few different groups of friends. There were the horsey girls who had land and horses, and they were kind of my earth mother friends. And then there were the girls I played hockey with, the sporty girls. And then there was Vicky. Vicky is what you might call mature for a teenage girl. Vicky was going with leg, and leg was a real spunk, and he had a car, and he had a job, and it was as if Vicky was on the next hill of life, and she was looking out and telling me what she could see, and giving me advice as to how I could prepare myself when I was on that hill. Vicky had one uh, hair after the other plucked eyebrows, and she plucked mine in the same shape, and she had light blue eyeshadow, and I wore light blue eyeshadow, and she had these curls that framed her face, and it was all flicked back very 70s. And Vicky had a, a wide knowledge of a, of a lot of subjects. She knew about boys and what you did with them. She knew about drinking and smoking and clothes and jewellery and piercing ears. She pierced both my ears. She froze the earlobe, stuck a big needle through. And at this stage in my life, I think I was probably a surprising handful for my parents. I was taking my adolescence very seriously and I was pushing up against all the boundaries that I could find. My parents, they were not unseasoned to their task. They had four older children, after all, and one younger. My dad, he was a man of few words and if he was around, he was the go-to parent because his default answer was yes. Oh, yes, you can go out, I suppose, or yes, you can have some money, or yes, they can come and stay over. My mum, on the other hand, who was running a household of six children, her default position was no. No, you are not going out. No, you are not wearing that. No, you cannot have any money for any more clothes. My dad also was the one who put his hand in his pocket and hand over the cash. Mm -hmm. Vicky and I used to go to these dances, the blue light discos I mentioned, once a month uh, on a Saturday night. And Vicky would stay at my house because she lived several suburbs away. And we'd, they were called police discos, but there was absolutely no policing happening whatsoever. It was a free-for-all in this great big darkened gym. And if my parents had any idea what I got up to in that hall, they would have been horrified. Vicky and I used to come home from the dances and we'd do our sweet, innocent teenager impersonations. We'd sit and have cocoa and in our jammies and say, no, no. And we'd go into my bedroom and we'd get into bed and we'd lie there for an hour or two until the silence descended. And then we would quickly get up, we would get completely dressed, I would tiptoe over to the sash window, and then we would both climb out and drop softly onto the concrete drive, and then we would tiptoe over to the gate, and I'd be flat, because it was right outside my parents' bedroom window, and we'd slip through, and then we'd crouch down under the window, and then we'd get to the end of the drive, and then we'd bolt down to the corner, and around, and then, and we walked about an hour, an hour and a half to Leg's house. And Leg happened to have a bungalow in his backyard, so we would tiptoe down Leg's parents' drive and we'd tap on that bungalow door and we'd slip in and there would be Leg for Vicky and there was, I think his name was Mick for me. And we'd hang out for a while and then we'd sleep and we'd walk all the way home and we'd climb back in that window and we'd collapse on our beds until the sun was high in the sky. Now Vicky had a friend, Deirdre, who lived around the corner from her in Faulkner, that's where Vicky lived, and I'd met Deidre a number of occasions when I'd stayed at Vicky's house. And Vicky hinted that things were sometimes hard at Deidre's house, that Deidre, um, her dad was a bit of a drinker and he had a temper and sometimes he was violent with Deidre's mum. Vicky's parents, they wanted a good education for their daughters and they sent them from Faulkner across to Essendon, to a girls' school in Essendon. They travelled over an hour each way. My parents also wanted a good education for me and they sent me to the same school. My parents, we have however, lived just around the corner. And while our parents were dreaming and paying for our good education, we had another curriculum that we were following. We were studying boys, what you did with them. We were studying alcohol, how you procured it and its effect on the body. We were studying cigarettes and how you got rid of the smell. Mm -hmm. uh, we were studying uh, fashion and music and other aspects of popular culture. 
We were rebellious and defiant, and we were hard done by. Our constant refrain was, well, why can't I go out? Why can't I do that on Saturday? Why, not? why can't I go with those boys that you've never met before? In that car, a typical conversation might be on a Monday morning, Vicky. Oh yeah, Leg and me, we went to the movies on Saturday night, it was a great movie, and then we met up with Leg's friends, we're having a grouse time, and then my mum rocks up at 10 o'clock to pick me up. Who gets picked up at 10 o'clock on a Saturday? Oh, dead set, Vicky, 10 o'clock sucks, that must have been so embarrassing. Oh, it reminds me, on Sunday, when you and Leg and Leg's friend and we're all going out, Mum said I can go, but I have to be home by six because she says Sunday's a school night. Oh, I can't wait to meet Lex Ryan. Is he a spunk? Because Vicky set me up with a few boys, you know what I mean? So, in our view, our lives were being ruined by like, our parents and their restrictions. And we kept a running tally of their transgressions. Mm -hmm. And we decided we would start a campaign, a campaign for a better life for ourselves. We all knew that we wanted quite a number of things the same. Uh, we wanted to go out more uh, often. We wanted to stay out later on Saturday and Friday nights. We wanted to go out with more question, less questions asked. And we wanted more economic independence. Vicky and Deirdre had a couple of other things that they wanted. So we decided we would go home and each put a demand, whatever we thought was convenient, or, or the right thing to do for our situation. So mine was kind of a little bit messy and I wanted to go out I'm gonna, I want to smoke at home. My old man, he smokes two packs a day in our lounge room. The whole house stinks and he tells me I can't smoke. I should be able to smoke at home. Vicky, I'm so sick of going to Dramana every second weekend. It is boring. If they want to go, they can go. I'm 15. I'm old enough to stay home on my own. So, we all went and made our demands. We got nowhere. Nowhere. Just brick walls everywhere. The answers were no, all round. And I probably would have left it at that. But Vicky and Deidre were more determined than me. And so Vicky came to school one day and she said, Deidre and I have been talking and we've decided the answer is we have to run away. Run away? Run away? Wow! I was so blown away by their gutsiness and I wanted to be part of that adventure. Imagine just stepping out into your own lives and and, 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 you know, taking it up to your parents and going out in the big wide world. I so wanted to be part of it with these girls who had this gumption. The trouble for me was things weren't that bad at home. Maybe I wasn't as wild as they were. Maybe I, my parents weren't as restricted. Maybe my brothers and sisters had paved the way. Whatever it was, whenever I imagined going off on that adventure, and I did imagine it a lot, I kept thinking about my family and at the time my mum was in Western Australia, she'd been there for over a month and my dad was holding a fort with very little grace but a good heart. And so when I think about the adventure, I just, I just kind of feel bad inside. I didn't have that burning sense of injustice that they had. So I grappled with the decision but eventually I decided I wasn't going to run away. And I felt a bit of relief. And, and kind of good about making that decision, but I then had to tell Vicky. And I, I so didn't want to let her down, and I, I wanted to support her in, in what she needed to do. So I thought about it a lot, and as I thought, I realised that by not running away, I could help. I could be the aider and abetter on the inside. Mm -hmm. And so I practised my words, and this is what I said to Vicky. Yeah, uh, I've been thinking about it and, and I just I just can't justify running away. Things just aren't that bad for me at home um, at the moment. And I, I, so I, I can't do it. But, you know, you and Deidre, I so understand. You really have to run away. There's no choice. I can see that. Your parents are just so bad. You've got to do it. And what I realise is that if I don't run away, I can help you. I, I can help you. Yeah, yeah. I figured you weren't going to run away. That's okay. And if you can help, that'd be great. So it was decided. So now I had to come up with a plan. And I've been thinking, my dad had this farm up near Seymour, and I've been thinking and hoping for a little while that maybe Vicky, Deidre and I and some girls and the boys that we were hanging out with, we could all go up to the farm overnight. So I asked my dad and he said yes. So then we decided that we wouldn't tell Vicky and Deidre's parents about 
the farm trip and they would run away to my house. I would hide them until Dad went to work on Saturday. Then when Dad came home, they'd be there and we'd all go up to the farm. And I even worked it out that I could tell my dad this without lying. So I worked it, I said, yeah, Dad, when, on Saturday when you come home from work, Vicky and Deirdre will be here and then we'll all go up to the farm together. So I wasn't lying in my little adolescent brain, I was still pure. So the next bit was Vicky and Deirdre's part. So they wrote letters of demand and on Friday night they got into bed and then they got up and they put the letters on their bedside table, they put bolsters under their bed and then they snuck out of the house and they met around the corner and then they walked. They walked across Faulkner, across North Coburg, Pasco Vale South, Strathmore, Essendon, to my house in New Orleans. I was fast asleep. I'd left the window open a little bit and into my sleep comes this, hey, 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 oh, and there are these two little faces staring at me in the window. And I was blown away. They'd done it. They'd done it. it, it all this talk and, and, and planning and finally it happened. So I race out of the house and I meet them and I take them down to the back shed and I lay out a bed for them in the dog's beds and cover them with the dog blankets and there'd been a pillow that had burst and I fluff all these feathers over just in case anyone came down to the shed. And then I went inside and I pretended everything was normal with my dad and I had breakfast and then dad went to work and my brothers disappeared and the coast was clear so Vicky and Deirdre came up, I gave them some food and we went into my bedroom and they sat up in my dressing gown and told me all about their epic journey. So, but we knew that there was one more part of the plan and I had a critical role to play in it. We knew that Vicky's parents would come looking and they would come looking to me. And I was terrified they were going to turn up on the front doorstep, but they rang late in the morning, the phone rang, and I'd said to Vicky, oh, I think I might be able to do it, maybe I can do it without lying. No way, if my dad gets any hint that you are hiding anything, he will be around here in a flash, you've got to lie. But I'm still secretly hoping. So my brother goes, Katie, phone. I slowly get up and I walk across to the hall of the telephone to hang up that phone. Hello? Hello, Katie, it's Mr. Abrahams here. Vicky's dad. Oh, hello, Mr. Abrahams, how are you? Well, I'm not too good, actually. Did you know that Vicky and Deirdre were planning on running away? Oh, I did hear them mention something about it. So far, so good. I'm not lying. It's all right, I'm in. Well, they did run away last night. Have you seen them? Ah, direct question. People are hard to not lie. I know that lying to this man is wrong. I can hear the worry in his voice. And I know I'm going to get into terrible trouble for lying. But dobbing, dobbing on my friends, wrecking their, their, their dreams. My, I'm on their team. My loyalty is with them. No, Mr. Abrahams, I haven't seen them. Oh, really? Are you sure? Yes, I'm sure. I haven't heard from them at all. Oh, very well then. Well, if you do hear from them, please let us know immediately. Vicky's mother and I are terribly worried. Oh, yes, Mr. Abrahams, I will. Bye. It didn't feel good lying to that man. But it did feel good to support my friends. It did feel good to honour my loyalty and my friendship. So after that, the weekend went according to plan. My dad came home, we, we went up to the farm. That night the boys were in a hut and the girls were sleeping in a house and we tried the same trick on my dad. We came out at the window, snuck around, go to the boys' hut. My dad was onto us in a flash. Oh, you girls, time for bed. And I snuck out so embarrassed of being caught red-handed that we all filed out and I sort of was hoping if I kept my head down, my dad wouldn't notice me in amongst the line of girls. But he didn't say anything. And the next morning, I'm not sure how it happened, but Vicky and Deidre were at the house and um, me and some of the other kids were up at the, the front gate and there were some cattle yards there and we're just hanging out and, and then a car came down the road and it was in a remote area and we all looked at the car and I'm sort of standing on these cattle railings looking and, and it gets closer and I peer and I, it's Mr. Abraham. What are the chances? What a coincidence. There he's out driving on a Sunday and this just happens to come past here. That's amazing. Oh, oh, only he wasn't. He was coming. So I ducked down behind those caveats and I snuck around to the, to the corner and I peer out through the gap and the car comes in and then it drives down to the house. And so I run from bush to tree to bush to get back to the house yard and I scramble up to the top of the hay shed, haystack and I lie flat where I can look down on the yard and see but not be seen. And there's the car, there's Vicky and Deidre sitting on the back step and the fathers are nowhere. And I'm really worried my dad's going to be in trouble because of what I did. And after about 20 minutes, they come out and all the fathers shake hands, so I'm relieved. Clearly my dad's not in trouble. 
and then the girls get in the car and the dads and they leave and then the boys come in, they're hotted up board and they leave and then it's just my dad and a couple of blokes that he was doing some farm work with. And I sort of wait a while and then I come down the haystack and I just sort of nonchalantly walk across here, I go to the house, have a drink of water. And I sort of come out and just sort of mooch on over to dad, wondering what he's going to say and he not say anything for a bit and then I fall in doing what he's doing and then finally, he, almost in passing, he says to me, two words. You all right? You're all right. And into those two words, I read everything. I read that my dad knew that I had a choice about running away or not, and I chose not to because of my family. I read that my dad knew that when I lied to Mr. Abrahams, I was honouring another value of loyalty to my friends, and that was okay. And it was like my faith in my family was repaid by my dad's faith in me. And now, as a parent, who's a little prone to saying, you know, a word or 500, too many in any given situation with my children, I reckon I could learn a thing or two from my dad and his two words.